Hello and welcome to the Thursday, September 21st, 2023 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. DNS TTLs, uh, that's a quick diary I wrote today to look at, well, normal data. As security analysts, we often focus on, well, malicious data and malicious traffic. But in order to really find these anomalies that lead us to this malicious traffic, we first have to understand what's normal. So I'm trying to do a little series here over the next few weeks or months, depending on how long it will take me, uh, to talk about some of the parameters to look at. and one parameter that's sort of interesting is this uh, TTL, the time to live, that's being returned with DNS responses. Best to collect that data between authoritative uh, name servers and your recursive name server, then you get the actual TTL as the authoritative name server intended it. If you do use like a forwarding setup, uh, then the TTLs can be a little bit more uh, iffy because, well, uh, they may already be reduced somewhat by the recursive uh, name server that you are forwarding your queries uh, to. What did I see for the TTLs? Uh, Well, uh, nothing out of uh, the ordinary, and that's uh, kind of a good thing. The fastest TTLs were for your A and uh, Quad A records. Interesting that Quad A was a little bit uh, longer than the A records. Also, the name server record was by far the longest lived records. And that's certainly something to look for, for name server records with a short TTL. That's often an indicator for malicious name servers going back to uh, malware from years and years ago, uh, like, uh, for example, a fast flux. So what I really want you to do with this is, well, try to figure out for your own network how you get these numbers, how do you understand what's normal. The numbers that I posted here, they're normal for my network. Your network may look a bit different. And CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, published an advisory with details regarding the Snatch ransomware. CISA usually does that when they're seeing some significant activity with a particular ransomware family like this. And the nice thing about these reports is that they list basically all the different TTPs and then also, of course, your indicators of compromise for the particular ransomware family. What sort of stuck out to me here a little bit in the report is that yet again, the initial access vector is RDP. That has been a problem for years now. Please nail down your RDP deployments. RDP is one of the big weaknesses here that people have in the network. So if you must expose RDP, find some guidance in how to do it securely, how to set up uh, RDP gateways, how to do strong authentication, all the good stuff uh, that keeps RDP somewhat secure. The same should also be true for other remote access mechanisms. I often see, for example, you know, good old console servers also not well secured, but Over the last few years, RDP has really been sort of the big gap that these ransomware attackers find in networks. And I don't think we have uh, talked this week yet about uh, malicious uh, NPM packages. Well, Sonatype has a new list uh, for us. They try to uh, basically impersonate uh, some uh, ESLint plugins, uh, TypeScript uh, tools and the like. The goal of these NPM packages, if you install them, is to exfiltrate secrets, in particular Kubernetes configurations and SSH keys. And then in vulnerabilities, uh, thanks to Outpost 24's research, we have uh, four new patched vulnerabilities in Nagios XI. The vulnerabilities themselves are not really all that uh, super critical. Yes, there are uh, three SQL injections and one cross-site scripting. Two of these SQL injection vulnerabilities do pretty much require admin access to the system. The one that's uh, kind of uh, more important, I think, maybe you could call it critical, is a SQL injection vulnerability in the banner acknowledging endpoint. What this means is that if there's a problem with a system that Nagios points out, Nagios being software that monitors your network, that everything is up and working, 
well, uh, there's a banner that the user may acknowledge by clicking on it. The endpoint actually counting the click is susceptible to SQL injection. So uh, this uh, could potentially be triggered by any user with access to Nagios once a banner is displayed. The reason Nagios is a sort of a critical piece of software is because it does monitor your network, what systems, what services are up and not. It often has some uh, at least limited uh, command execution capability on uh, systems in your network and it could be used as a system and tool for lateral movement or to escalate privileges further if an attacker would be able to compromise your Nagos install. Well, and this is it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.